On a cold winter's day in 1882, the SS Nova Scotians sailed into the St. John's Harbor. On board was Armin Nutting. The 21-year-old had left her home in Quebec to become the new principal of one of the city's schools. Alone and already homesick, she made her way through the unfamiliar streets to her new boarding house. It was an inconspicuous arrival of a remarkable woman. She didn't know it at the time, but Armin would one day revolutionize the social and political landscape of her adopted home. Armin Nutting was born on November 6, 1861, in Waterloo, Quebec. She didn't come from a wealthy family, and her father's alcohol addiction added to the problems. Armin's mother, Harriet, made ends meet by sewing, making hats, and taking on as many odd jobs as she could find. She was determined to give her children a better life and believed that education was key. Harriet worked hard to pay for Armin's private tutors. Harriet's example, her sacrifices, her long hours doing underappreciated and underpaid work had a deep impact on Armin it would underpin her future fight for women's rights. But for now, Armin studied, and she was an excellent student, so much so that she was accepted into McGill University's normal school. She studied to become a teacher. In 1882, Armin applied for and got a job as the principal of the Church of England Girls' School in St. John's. She packed her things and left behind everything she knew. St. John's was not nearly as rich or as sophisticated as the city she had left behind, but Armin quickly found that the people made up for any shortcomings. In spite of its remoteness, the severity of its climate, and the difficulties and oftentimes hard conditions of life in St. John's, there existed behind that stern and rock-bound coast a lively, interesting, and warm-hearted community life. One person in particular attracted Armin's eye, Gilbert Gosling. He was renting a room in the same boarding house where Armin lived. One year earlier, Gilbert had moved to St. John's from Bermuda to work at Harvey & Company. It was a merchant firm involved in the saltfish trade. The two were young and alone in an unfamiliar town. They had something else in common, too. They were both strong supporters of women's rights. In 1886, they supported an effort to introduce mixed camping excursions of women and men to the colony. But the project attracted so much criticism that it had to be shelved. Armin and Gilbert took it in stride. They were determined to not let one setback destroy their plans to bring about future change. When I expressed surprise at this, for I had been camping that summer in Canada, Gilbert reminded me, that only in recent years had it been considered proper for a woman to skate in Newfoundland, and that the first one who did so in St. John's was thought to have overstepped the bounds of decorum. They were certainly very much behind the times, but who can point the finger of scorn at these or any other inhibitions? Have we not read that the man who first opened an umbrella in Philadelphia was arrested? The couple got married in 1888, as was conventional for married women at the time, Armin resigned from her job and took up charitable work. She also began to raise her growing family. She gave birth to six children, but two died before they were a year old. Perhaps because of her experiences as a new mother, she began to advocate for better maternal health and child welfare. In 1897, she volunteered with the Cowan Mission to build a new wing for women and children at the General Hospital. The ambitious project gave Armin a crash course in business and politics. She and the other volunteers had to organize fundraising drives, negotiate with the government for grants, manage a large budget, and oversee construction in general. Armin's volunteer work also brought into focus how hard women work to improve society, but how much society undervalued their contributions. A tipping point came in 1904. Armin was overseeing a large fundraising event for the Church of England Cathedral. She and the other women raised about $150,000 in today's money. 
I find myself philosophizing over the position of women in connection with these matters, and reflecting on the willingness with which we women support so loyally an institution that encourages us to work and takes with eagerness all the money we can earn, but denies us any voice in its expenditure. Armin's convictions deepened one year later when she traveled to England to bring her daughter to a boarding school. While there, Armin met the suffragist Lavinia Dock. Although newspapers in Newfoundland tended to dismiss suffragists as troublemakers, Armin's time overseas exposed her to a different point of view. Her interest in the suffrage movement steadily grew. By then, Armin and Gilbert had created a good life in Newfoundland. Gilbert was secure in his profession and rising through the ranks. The couple enjoyed an enviable social standing, and they had enough money to hire a cook and a housemaid. This gave Armin more time for other pursuits. She was now at a stage in her life when she could afford, both financially and socially, to speak her mind publicly. In 1908, she wrote a groundbreaking letter to the St. John's Daily News. No country can call itself free while one whole class is governed without representation. But it is heartening to know that be the fight short or be the fight long, the issue is not for a moment in doubt. The women's suffrage movement cannot possibly be defeated, because it is in harmony with all the upward forces of human life and progress. The letter was the first public statement by a Newfoundland woman in support of suffrage since a failed attempt to win the vote in the 1890s. Armin would devote the next 17 years of her life to the cause. She was joined by other women, like Frances McNeil and Myra Campbell. Local newspapers began to write more and more about the suffrage movement, and it was debated in clubs and societies. But there was a problem. Women were largely barred from taking part in the discussion. This became clear in 1909 when Myra Campbell and some other women attended an anti-suffrage lecture at a local men's club. When the women challenged the speaker's argument, they were banned from future events. Armin Gosling was not deterred. She decided to form a club for women. The ladies' reading room opened that December in downtown St. John's. Within its walls, women read international newspapers and magazines, they debated current affairs, and became skilled public speakers. In 1912, Armin Gosling gave a landmark speech at the reading room. It was called Woman Suffrage. Most of our opponents have nothing more convincing to advance than men are men and women are women, and then they think they've clinched the matter. So they have, but not in the way they imagine. It is just because men are men and totally different from women that they cannot satisfactorily legislate for both. Armin's speech was so popular that it was published and sold for 10 cents a copy. She had become the intellectual leader of the suffrage movement. But just as the movement was gaining ground, the world went to war. The suffrage movement was scaled down as women answered the call to duty. Some, like Armin's daughter, served overseas as ambulance drivers or nurses. Others stayed home and joined the Women's Patriotic Association. The WPA raised huge amounts of money which underpinned Newfoundland's war effort. Soon, a vast network of 250 WPA branches stretched across the island. Women were more connected and more coordinated than ever before. Armin Gosling was the WPA's secretary. She recognized that once peace was restored, the WPA's network could expand the suffrage movement beyond St. John's. After the war finally ended in 1918, Armin spearheaded a reinvigorated suffrage movement. In 1920, she became a founding member of the Newfoundland Women's Franchise League. Suffragists wrote letters to the government, they canvassed houses and businesses and published articles in local newspapers. Tapping into the WPA's network, they also circulated a petition across the island. It eventually gathered 20,000 signatures. The League achieved its first success in 1921 when St. John's granted women the municipal vote. Part of the groundwork had been laid by Armin's husband. 
In 1916, Gilbert had been elected mayor of St. John's. And one year before that, he was part of a commission that recommended municipal voting rights for women. As always, Gilbert wholeheartedly supported Armin's opinions and her hard work. But the greatest victory came in March of 1925, when the Newfoundland government unanimously passed a suffrage bill. It became law one month later. But Armin Gosling was not there to celebrate with her fellow suffragists. She was in Bermuda. Gilbert's health had deteriorated to the point that he could no longer withstand a Newfoundland winter. Acting on his doctor's advice, the couple was spending springs and winters in Bermuda. They moved there permanently in 1927. Gilbert's health steadily deteriorated, and he died in 1930. I was proud to be his wife. There was always between us a quite extraordinary companionship, a camaraderie, that lasted and grew throughout our life together. As I look back upon it, there seems to have been something ideal about the perfect understanding that existed between us. Armin returned to Newfoundland for one last visit in 1934. She donated the vast collection of books that she and Gilbert owned to the city of St. John's. The Gosling Memorial Library was the first free public library in Newfoundland, and it was Armin's final gift to the home she had loved so much. Armin Nutting Gosling died in Bermuda on December 15, 1942. She was 81 years old. <laughs>